welcome to April. Wait a second. Welcome to early May. That's it, right? Yeah. No, it's definitely April's, but we had the delay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, the reason, well, we, we got bumped by Jocelyn Belbonnell. So that's probably an okay kind of bump. Um, it's a great talk she did last week, last Wednesday, for everyone that managed to pop along. And there was free booze as well. You had to pay to get in, but it was free booze once you were in. Yeah. Oh, she would have been there. Okay. All right. Um, so, yeah, uh, we will actually have another talk in May. So we've got a talk at the end of May 31st. Um, so we've got two talks in May, uh, none in April. And tonight, uh, uh, welcome uh, Ian Ridpath, who's going to uh, give us a chat. When we walked on the moon and when will we return? Um, he's going to have to rewrite this in two years' time, no doubt. Fingers crossed in 2025 when Artemis III goes and softly lands crossed on the moon. Um, so it's good to get this uh, well ahead of schedule. Uh, Let's try clicking on the presentation before it <laughs> works. Okay, this is the darkness be gone month. In the by the end of May, actual you, you only have twilight. Okay, so um, real deep darkness is going to go be gone in the next three weeks or so. The sun just doesn't go uh, low enough uh, below the northern horizon. Um, but there's still loads of stuff to see, and actually it's just a subtle dimming. It's not sort of a, it's a more of a classification of how low the sun goes than anything else. And it does mean that other things become possible uh, possibilities, such as noctilucent clouds, et cetera. So um, it's not all down, uh, uh, down news. Um, there's, I promise there will be some clear nights. I'm not sure how much... Uh, <laughs> Based on the fact that I went to Astro Camp and it was some of the worst weather they saw, perhaps I'm not the luckiest person in the world. Um, we'll have to see. Um, we've now got 105 members, so that's, gosh, about two or three or four more than last month. No. Um, I went up there the other day and uh, had a good chinwag with them. So we're going to do more sort of partnership stuff with them. And we're sort of trying to organize a shared beginner's course to astronomy. We'll share that with Cardiff as well to online, um, which will be great. Uh, so, yeah, um, rather than fighting, we try to collaborate uh, with our members. Um, with that news, I have to say it, it is official. Beckington is now gone. As of yesterday, they were planning a final meeting, but they couldn't actually get enough people to go to the final meeting to make it worthwhile to have a final meeting. Um, it was, and I, I had a conversation with John, who helped form the society about 25 years ago. And it was sort of like, and all I could say, well, Bath, uh, Bath Astronomical Society had its heyday and then it went quiet and it comes back again. So these things do come back. You just need a few keen people to sort of have that energy and then it, it, it can relaunch. Um, so hopefully for them, uh, and I'm not sure whether I mentioned it, an unlucky month for astronomical societies, Tiverton and Mid-Devon Astronomical Society are also closing its doors. Um, same reason, can't get people on the committee. So thank you, thank you, stay, <laughs> stay on the, don't leave, don't leave me. Uh, we have our, our good fighting force uh, in the committee here. A uh, few of them on their uh, eternal holidays. I don't think Jonathan actually has much time. And maybe there's tax issues. He has to stay away from um, Saltford and Somerset uh, for most of the year. It does seem to be. Uh, I'm glad Merrick is still alive. You're alive, aren't you, Merrick? Hopefully you are. We lost you last Wednesday. Yes. We were, yeah, we were almost sending search parties out for you. <laughs> yeah, I'm still here. That's, that's good. Uh, uh, yeah, Dame Jocelyn Belbonel, she sent her love. Thanks. And perhaps we'll see you next time. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> so there's eight of us in our committee. So uh, fighting strong, um, sort of, uh, it's easier in uh, larger numbers. So let, let's sort of keep that energy up. If you see any of these people on the street, feel free to stop them, make them buy you a cup of tea, anything like that. Um, remember, we've got loads of benefits of being a member. Um, so not just the um, newsletter that goes out. So uh, hopefully everyone got a copy of the newsletter and had a read. Sorry, it was slightly larger um, than usual, but that's because we wanted toilet, uh, pictures of toilet tents uh, uh, in there. 
and all the craziness for the write-up from Astrocamp and lots of pictures because everyone likes pictures. Um, we're a member of the Federation of Astronomical Societies. What does that actually mean to you? Um, oh gosh, that's a hard question. No, it means they have an annual uh, convention you can go along to. Um, but the main one is that when we set up telescopes and say to anyone that walks past, oh, would you like to look and see what's inside our telescope and look through that? If they trip up and bang their head or they try to sue you, our membership of FAS and the, um, the public liability insurance we have covers us for that. OK, so that's one of the reasons, one of the major reasons we're part. There's lots of sharing going on as well. But in terms of what practical use is it, it's so that you can feel safe allowing other people to use your telescope because you are covered by that insurance. Uh, it, it. <laughs> it, it, it is events run by Bath, Astro uh, Bath Astronomers. Um, now, it doesn't apply for your neighbours, um, but if you phoned, said, Simon, I'm inviting a few people round to my house tonight, can I call it a Bath Astronomers event? And if I say yes, or anyone from the committee says yes, that is technically a Bath Astronomers event. Yeah, okay. Um, so <laughs> just don't do it afterwards because they'll catch you in court. <laughs> um, okay, so that's why the FFS, you get free entry to this museum. So you can come in as many times as you'd like. You can enjoy the garden. If you've got a sandwich and you want to eat a sandwich in a nice garden, well, you've got free entry. You can come in and have your sandwich on the spot that the, uh, where Uranus was discovered as well. And we have um, lone telescopes as well. Um, Currently, we've, well, we've bought two new uh, loan telescopes I talked about previously, um, Caroline and Cecilia, um, after Caroline Herschel and Cecilia Payne Potchkin. And we've got a new entrant now. So these are pretty much auto, just click them together and they work. Um, this eight inch Celestron on a full go-to mount is a bit more for, you've had a bit of experience with telescopes and you'd like uh, something that's a, a sort of bit more meaty. So you don't want to go out and buy uh, kit to say, take some, uh, astro photos um, uh, but you can borrow it and try it out so um, this one is called Chandra um, after uh, the, the chap that invented the Chandra Sekar limit um, oh I'm trying to remember who oh, I can't remember his first name uh, anyway so we've got that and we've also got Edwin Edwin Hubble as a little uh, telescope so these are new effectively the OTA is second hand but the telescope as uh, so the mount is all new these are all new uh, Edwin is a second-hand telescope and makes a little bit of noise. That's one of the reasons why we've upgraded. The other telescopes, I think they're, they're, they're just too much hassle um, to actually put out on loan. But we've got uh, four telescopes that are actually fully working and pretty much um, ready to go. A Mac. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Apple Mac. <laughs> Slightly confused. So there's loads of reasons um, there, but uh, so use them. Uh, you, uh, sort of, uh, we've got a booking system online. So if you go onto the website, um, there's a lovely honesty question. Are you a member of Bath Astronomers? If you answer no, it's not gonna go anywhere. <laughs> it's kind of a bit of a hint that it's only for Bath Astronomers. Um, we still do get people applying um, who aren't Bath Astronomers um, for the loan telescopes. I say, join and you can take part. And one person has actually done that. Um, so uh, that's good news. Okay, so um, the most important part is the community day. Okay, so we've got uh, lovely team makers here uh, with Jade and Merrick, uh, and we've got Mike as well, uh, and Annie in the background, but just sort of just actually getting to see people. You can live your entire life on YouTube, watching YouTube videos and going online on Zoom, but you miss a certain aspect of it, especially um, building a kit in the middle of the night and something, something doesn't work. Being able to ask someone, oh, do you know anything about this? Could I have a little bit of advice? That would take hours to find on YouTube. You can find it in the brains of uh, lots of uh, people in the club. So uh, it's all about the people. That's the most important thing. Most, the biggest benefit, I think, from joining any astronomical society. Oh, what we've done this month? Well, uh, I've been out and about. Uh, we've not done too much, but I've been out and about uh, running the planetarium. So we've done two sessions in the planetarium the last month. 
the, the uh, Explorer Scout even got to see the moon on this left-hand image. Can you just see there's a little moon there? Uh, behind a lot of cloud. <laughs> they got to see it. And uh, we're doing standard shows in there and also just doing what's happening in the night sky sessions as well uh, with them. So well, that was kind of fun. And uh, all these ones uh, are, these are chargeable events. So um, uh, when we do planetarium sessions, there's a minimum fee of 30 pounds that we charge. Um, if they're uh, uh, if they're sort of establishments such as the National Trust or whatever, we charge more. Um, it covers the insurance, which eventually we'll get, um, and wear and tear, uh, because actually blowing these uh, planetariums up and down and sort of packing them up and sort of blowing them up again, packing them, but it, it does cause some damage to um, uh, the outside uh, and also the inside, so we have to keep those in tip-top condition. Um, but mostly everything I've organized this month has been rained off. Um, so well done me. Um, I, I've got 100% records uh, over April of doing. And, and if, if you want the, the, the really amusing story, I went to Astro Camp in Wales, which is run by Awesome Astronomy. It was horrid, 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 horrid. So I made the decision because I had a really tough uh, day ahead at work to actually leave. Okay. <laughs> I was driving down on the motorway. They were reporting the skies are clearing. <laughs> and then the best aurora they've seen ever happened above their heads. So I think I've got a reputation now. I don't think I can go back. <laughs> Call me lucky. <laughs> yeah, but I got the work done. <laughs> Not quite the same. Um, but we did have a nice uh, uh, meet up with um, Professor um, Jocelyn Bell Burnell last week, and we asked if she would like to do some events with us in 2024. And she said she's just down the road. As long as we make it near the weekends, then there's a good chance she'd be able to support us. So one for the planner there. Um, she's not replied to the emails. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what we've got is terms of upcoming talks. Um, this coming month, we've got Dr. Han Wakeford. Uh, she's been talking about exoplanets and sort of working out the atmospheres of exoplanets, what we can find about that. Uh, Mary McIntyre is our last speaker for this official year, and she'll be talking about women and astronomy part two. And uh, then we're going to start the, the season again with doc, uh, Dr. Becky Smedhurst. She's um, offered to come down to see us from uh, Oxford, um, and uh, she is the Dr. Becky from YouTube. She uh, sort of posts things, uh, it's like two or three videos every week. Been doing it for the last three or four years. She's been doing loads of stuff before that. She has half a million um, YouTube followers. She doesn't do astro societies, but because we're so kind of annoying in the scene and she knows about what we do and et cetera, she's actually offered to do it as a, a one-off for us. That's great. Um, we've come... Podcast, that's why. Um, and we're trying with the museum to probably organize a little competition amongst local schools for people to come and uh, meet an actual astrophysicist. So uh, either drawing competition, a photo competition or a writing competition, or actually all three of those categories. And then the people before the, our talk, um, uh, we'll, we'll bring Becky into the museum and um, sort of she can say hello to all these competition winners and we sort of do some sort of prizes and things like that. So try and make it a little bit bigger than just her popping down from Oxford. Uh, we've got Steve Warbis uh, in October uh, to talk probably about astrophotography. We always want an astrophotography talk, um, but Steve talks about loads of stuff. Um, he helps run an astro society uh, in the Midlands, a uh, very popular speaker. And then uh, we've got uh, Richard Hook um, in November and he's ex of the European Southern Observatory. Um, so he used to do a lot of their media and relations for them, um, engineer by trade. Um, so he's gonna to talk to us about the uh, big telescopes, the European Southern Observatory, the history of the big telescopes going through all the way to the ones they're building right now. Um, so that'll be quite a fun and interesting talk, hopefully. Um, so as I said, the next one is 31st of May. So that's gonna be Hannah. She's gonna pop down, she's based in Bristol. Um, so she, she's going to uh, hop down um, and uh, hopefully uh, give us a wonderful talk about atmospheres. Now, I have probably talked way too long. I have talked way too long. 
So what we need to do is hand over to Ian. Now, Ian's been talking uh, all about and lecturing all about astronomy and astronomical things since 1972, uh, a very busy bunny. Now, I don't actually like to think about how long ago 1972 was. Well, were you, uh, you must have been sort of uh, just maybe three years old or something. I, I don't know, Ian, uh, to be doing it that long. Um, I, I'm old enough to remember the moon landings. OK, well, as long as you weren't uh, on the moon, then that's that's fine. Um, and uh, also he's done his stints on BBC TV and those kind of things, a sort of uh, uh, correspondent, etc. But where have you known? You might have seen that name. It might keep echoing with you. I've seen that name before. <coughs> well, it's probably on your bookshelf. I hope uh, so. Yeah, Ian is a very prolific writer, uh, continues. And so uh, I, I, if you've got a few books on your bookshelf, I, I challenge you not to have an Ian Ridpath up there. OK, so um, and he continues to write. Um, so uh, hopefully um, maybe we'll get to see you in person Ian, and we'll uh, get a few books out and uh, do a bit, a bit of a signing session. That'd be lovely. That'd be very nice one day. Right now. <laughs> Can, okay, I start, so can I start you? now? Have you finished? All right, good. <laughs> so they all love you here. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen here. So let's play that there. And so today I am, as I said, I've actually lived through what I'm going to be telling you about. We're going to go exploring the moon in the footsteps of the Apollo astronauts. And I'm going to start by going back to the early unmanned probes, which paved the way. And then I'll talk in detail about the Apollo landings, particularly Apollo 11, the first of them. And then finally, I'll come up to date by looking briefly at some plans for what's, what's been happening more recently and some plans for returning to the moon. Now, the moon was one of the first things that I got interested in when I took up astronomy. And uh, of course, the great thing is, you can see it even in twilight. You don't need dark skies. And it, you know, it is just very easy to see. And I'm sure you'll all have looked through binoculars at the moon and you'll know that you can see with just a simple pair of binoculars, you can see quite a bit of detail, and including its main surface features, which are the bright areas, the highlands, and the dark areas, the lowlands. And as I'm sure you all know, the lowlands are called the seas or the maria in Latin, because when people such as Galileo first began to look at the moon through telescopes 400 years ago, they thought that these areas really were water. But we now know that they're just areas where molten lava once flowed out from inside the moon, which then cooled and hardened. So wherever you see dark areas on the moon, you're seeing solidified volcanic lava. And it's actually very similar to basalt rock on the Earth. And the largest of the dark areas make up the familiar pattern that you can see with a naked eye called the man in the moon. Although when you see it in large like here in this picture, the, the face rather vanishes and you start to see some other shapes. And I don't know, if you, don't know if you ever noticed the shape on the right of the moon here, which looks like a poodle dog complete with a pom-pom on its tail. And the pom-pom is called Mare Chrysium, the Sea of Chryses, and we'll encounter that again later. Now, since the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, there's been nothing to protect it from being pummeled by impacts from debris, such as asteroids, comets, and meteorites over its entire lifetime. So the whole surface is peppered with craters of all sizes. And around the most recent ones, you can see the pulverized rock that was thrown out by the force of the impact producing bright rays. Although when I say recent, the ones that I've labeled here are still very old, dating back over a hundred million years to a time when the dinosaurs were roaming the Earth and even long before that. And we'll be taking a closer look at these two craters, Copernicus and Tycho, a bit later on. Well, as the Moon orbits the Earth every month, as you know, I don't need to tell you, it goes through its familiar cycle of phases. And I'm sure you're all aware that it keeps the side face, same side facing us all the time. So you always see the same features. And this isn't just coincidence. It's because the Earth's gravity has braked the spin of the moon and locked it. It's called a captured rotation. 
Now, the synchronization isn't quite perfect because the moon's orbit isn't exactly circular, so there's a bit of rocking and rolling around that you see on this speeded up simulation. But basically, we see the same side of the moon all the time. So because of this captured rotation, until the first space probes were sent up, we'd never seen the far side of the moon. We only knew what half the moon looked like. The other half was a mystery. So it was quite a sensation in 1959 when the Russian space probe Luna 3 was sent around the moon and took the first pictures of the far side. Now, they're not very good by today's standards, and frankly, I, I don't think they were very good by 1959 standards either, to be honest. But at the time, they were awesome, <clears throat> and people began to realize that we were about to undergo a revolution in our understanding of the moon and the planets. And even though the picture is from Luna 3 is pretty fuzzy, you can at least see that there are hardly any of the dark maria on the far side. And this was a surprise, and we still don't fully understand why the two halves should look so different. And the most prominent features on these first pictures were an elliptical dark area at the upper right, which the Russians named the Sea of Moscow, and a crater with a dark floor named Zhilkovsky after a Russian pioneer of spaceflight. Now, the Russians included part of the near side for orientation purposes, and at the left you can see Mare Crasium, which is the pom-pom on the poodle's tail, which I pointed out earlier. Now, in the late 1950s and early 1960s, an intense rivalry developed in space between the Americans and the Russians. And this was the days of the Cold War. Unfortunately, we're entering another Cold War now as well, aren't we? But the days of the Cold War, when each side was trying to score propaganda victories over the other. And at this stage, the Russians were well ahead on points. They'd put the first satellite into orbit around the Earth, Sputnik 1, in 1957. Then they sent the first probes to the moon, and things got worse for the Americans in 1961, when this man, a Russian fighter pilot called Yuri Gagarin, became the first man in space. Well, at that time, John F. Kennedy was president of the United States, and he was determined to deliver a knockout blow. And he decided that the, that the only way to do that was to put the first man on the moon. So in May of 1961, just six weeks after Gagarin's flight, Kennedy made his famous commitment to place a man on the moon before the decade was out. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. So Kennedy had turned the space race into the moon race and set the stage for a very exciting decade ahead. So we can see that the Apollo program was a political initiative. It wasn't about science, although a lot of science came out of it, but its main motive was to beat the Russians. And as we know, that's what they did. So if we were going to send people to the moon, we needed to know a lot more about what they would find when they got there. And that meant sending unmanned probes to pave the way. And the Americans started with a series called Ranger. And it took seven attempts before one worked properly. Space hardware wasn't as reliable then as it is now. But the last three were very successful. And they sent back a rapid sequence of pictures as they approached the moon, showing smaller and smaller details until the probe finally smashed into the surface and was destroyed. And this is a sequence from Ranger 8, which hit the moon not far from where Apollo 11 eventually landed. And you can see we're going over those two big craters. Then as we get closer and closer, you can see smaller and smaller features until finally, bam. And the noise at the right of the final frame is because the probe was destroyed while it was still transmitting it. And what we found from the range of pictures is that there are tiny, tiny craters down to only a yard or so across on even the flattest parts of the moon. And they're all caused by impacts of small meteorites. Well, the next step was to soft land a probe on the surface. And while the Americans were preparing to do that, the Russians got in first with Luna 9. And Luna 9 was a sphere about the size of a beach ball with four petals that opened up so that it sat upright and its camera could look around. So this is the first ever view from the surface of the moon, showing a few, few rocks 
and some shallow craters. And the surface looks a lot rougher th th on, on this picture than it really is because it was taken under a very low sun. And you know when you're driving along at night how your headlights make the roads look rough. And this is the same effect. Well, the American landers were a lot more sophisticated and in many ways were more like a miniature version of the Apollo lunar module that was to come later. And they were called Surveyor. And there were seven attempts in all, five of which worked. And it was a very successful series. And this is what they saw, or at least what a couple of them saw. Now, this is a montage of lots of individual frames showing part of the lunar landscape. And you can see how careful you have to be when landing because there are big rocks everywhere. And this is a picture that Surveyor 5 took of its own footpad. And to the right of it, there's a gouge in the soil where it slid downhill on landing. Now, although the surface is covered with lava flows, it's not like the hard, jagged lava that you'd find in places like Iceland or Hawaii, because it's been ground down into dust over billions of years by a drizzle of impacts from tiny meteorites, which have a sandblasting effect. And a bit later on, I'll show you a picture from the second man landing, Apollo 12, which actually landed just a short walk away from one of these surveyors. Well, at the same time as the surveyors were giving us an astronaut's eye view of the surface, a series of five lunar orbiters was surveying possible landing sites from above, and their pictures were vital for planning the Apollo landings. And the lunar orbiters also took a few tourist snaps of features of particular interest. And for example, here's the ray crater called Tycho that I pointed out earlier. Although this picture was taken under a low sun, and you don't see the rays. But what you do see are the typical features of a large impact crater. You have the central peak, which is caused by rebound of the underlying layers and slumping of the walls to form terracing. And this thing is huge. It's big enough to swallow a city. And here's the outline of London to the same scale. Now, of course, on Earth, we've been protected by our atmosphere from impacts like this. But the moon doesn't have any atmosphere, so it's been wide open. And the lunar orbiters also looked sideways to take oblique views of the surface, and these gave us a completely different perspective on the features that we're so used to seeing from above. Um, and this is the view across the uh, crater Copernicus, which is actually a bit bigger than Tycho. And all around it, you can see splash marks where debris was thrown out from the impact that formed it. And one thing that oblique pictures like this bring home is that the outer rim of craters are nowhere near as steep and mountainous as you might expect. The old science fiction film showed lunar mountains as very steep and jagged, but they're not like that at all in reality. And here's a lunar orbiter view of that far side crater with the dark floor called Zhilkovsky that Luna 3 first spotted. And you can see how rugged the far side is. And you'll notice that the lunar orbiter pictures have a banded appearance, and that because that's because the pictures were sent back in strips which were assembled on Earth. So whenever you see lunar orbiter pictures, they always have these stripes across them. And I should add that the Russians also sent their own lunar orbiters, but their results weren't a patch on the American ones. And in retrospect, we can see that although the Russians like to do things first, they never did them quite as well. And a lot of their plans really amounted to spoiling tactics. And that attitude persisted right up to the time of the first Apollo landing, as we'll see. While all this unmanned exploration was going on, the rockets and the spacecraft that would actually carry the astronauts to the moon were being developed. And to send humans to the moon needed the largest and most powerful rocket ever built. They called it the Saturn V. And it was an incredible feat of engineering for its day, but because there were so many backups and duplicate systems, it proved to be very reliable. Well, the Saturn V had three stages, although only the top stage went into orbit around the Earth. Uh, the first two stages were discarded as the fuel in them was used up. And the astronauts were in the silver bit at the top, and the lunar landing module was tucked away beneath them. And on the very top of it all, was the escape tower, which would have pulled the astronauts clear if the rocket had blown up during launch, which fortunately it never did. And the astronauts travelled in the conical command module. 
And there were three of them in there, and it was quite a tight squeeze. And the command module was the only bit that came back to Earth. Behind it was a cylinder called the service module, which provided them with air and water and electricity. And behind that was a large rocket engine for putting them into orbit around the moon and then boosting them back to Earth again. And in the picture here, these are actually the command and service modules for Apollo 11 being stacked on top of the launch rocket. And these were the men who made that historic flight. Neil Armstrong, the overall commander, who sadly died in 2012. Michael Collins, who was in charge of the command module, who died two years ago. And Buzz Aldrin, dear old Buzz, who was the co-pilot on the lunar landing module. And he's the only one of the three who's still with us. Well, once they were safely on their way to the moon, the astronauts turned the command and service modules and docked with the lunar module, which was stored in what you might call the baggage compartment behind them. And then they didn't have much to do for the next couple of days while they coasted to the moon. And when they got to the moon, they fired the service module's big engine to go into orbit around it. And one of the things you see when you're orbiting the moon is the Earth rise over the horizon every time you go around. Now, from the moon, the Earth looks like a multicolored marble with blue seas and white clouds. And it's worth remembering that back in 1969, these pictures were very powerful and they were seized upon by the environmental movement to emphasize how small and vulnerable the Earth really is. So the great moment of the first landing was getting close. Armstrong and Aldrin crawled through a hatch into the lunar module and undocked. And they named the lunar module the Eagle. And this is how it looked to Michael Collins, who was left behind in the command module. And as you can see, it's not exactly what you'd call streamlined, but it didn't need to be because it was only ever going to operate in the vacuum of space. Now, poor old Michael Collins, he's been rather relegated by history to the status of a quiz trivia question. You know, who was the third man on the Apollo 11 flight, the, the one who didn't land on the moon? Well, he said that he was perfectly satisfied with being the third man on the flight, but he did also confess that his greatest fear was having to return to Earth on his own if Armstrong and Aldrin didn't come back from the lunar surface. Well, the landing site was in the southwestern Mare Tranquillitatis, or Sea of Tranquility, and that's the area where the unmanned probe Ranger 8 came down, if you remember the little movie we looked at earlier. And I'll zoom in on the area in, the, in there to show it in more detail. And the landing spot itself was deliberately chosen to be as flat and featureless as possible for safety reasons. And after they'd landed, Neil Armstrong named it Tranquility Base. Listen, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. And looking back, it, it still seems astonishing, particularly that they did it at the first attempt. And the astronauts themselves admitted afterwards that even they thought they had only a sort of 50-50 chance of succeeding. And this is what it looked like, seen out of the window of the lunar module on the surface. It's actually pretty much like what we'd already seen from the surveyor images. Rocks scattered around and a few small craters, almost like a desert on Earth. Well, the original flight plan called for them to get some sleep before they went for their moonwalk, but quite how anyone thought they were going to feel sleepy with all that adrenaline pumping around of having just become the first humans to land on the moon, I don't know. But not surprisingly, they wanted to go out straight away. And Armstrong was the first to venture out onto the surface in his moon suit. And he had to climb down a ladder attached to one of the legs of the lunar module. Then he, st he stood for a moment on one of the foot pads and then stepped off. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. Now... Some people would have you believe that this was all a mock-up in a Hollywood studio, but if it had been, they'd have, they'd have done a retake because he fluffed his lines. He said one small step for a man, and it should have been one for a man. And there are no retakes in real life. And then Aldrin came down the ladder to join him. And this is one of the most iconic pictures of the space age. Buzz Aldrin on the surface of the moon. 
And it is Aldrin, not Armstrong, because all Armstrong was the chief photographer and he carried the camera. So there were hardly any pictures of him on the moon at all. But you can see Armstrong and the lunar module reflected in Aldrin's visor. Well, even in their bulky spacesuits, the two of them were able to move around easily because of the moon's gravity is only one sixth that of the Earth. And they collected rock samples and set up experiments, including a sheet to trap particles from the solar wind, a laser reflector to measure the precise distance of the moon, a seismometer to measure moon, qu moon quakes, and of course, the flag, which even had a little rod across the top to make it stand out straight, because of course, there's no wind on the moon to blow it. And I should emphasize that planting the flag doesn't mean that they claimed ownership of the moon, because international law says you cannot lay claim to any celestial body. The only rights they got were bragging rights over the Russians. Well, Armstrong and Aldrin were out moonwalking for about two hours before they finally had to go back in and get some sleep before taking off again. They were actually on the moon for less than 24 hours from touchdown to takeoff, but later missions spent up to three days on the surface. Now, the lunar module came in two halves. The lower half was called the descent stage because it had the big engine for controlling the landing. And you can just see that in, in this picture to the right of the astronaut working on the surface. And the astronauts themselves were in the top half called the ascent stage, which had its own engine for taking off again using the lower stage as a launch pad. So the bottom half was left behind at each landing site. And there are six of these still on the surface, which I dare say future explorers will visit one day. Now, there aren't any pictures of Apollo 11 taking off, but I've got a little movie from the very last Apollo mission, Apollo 17, which was taken by a camera that was left on the surface and remotely controlled from Earth. And you'll hear them doing a little countdown, and then you'll see a sudden splash as the engine ignites and bits are blown everywhere, and the cameraman on Earth follows the lunar module as it rises up. So here we go. Four days. Four days. Engine arm is out there. Okay, I'm going to get the pro. 99, proceeded, 3, 2, 1, ignition. Run right away, Houston. That's your good. Ag side. Good shoulder. That's here, you have good thrust. And here's the top half of the lunar module back in orbit. And you can see it doesn't have legs anymore. They were left behind on the moon. Well, after docking with the command module and getting back into it with their precious haul of moon rocks, the astronauts discarded the lunar module and fired the big engine in the service module to return home. And unlike the space shuttle, of course, Apollo didn't land on a runway, but it splashed down in the ocean and the astronauts were fished out into a rubber dinghy and then winched into a helicopter. And they were then subjected to the indignity of being held in quarantine in a trailer for over a fortnight, just in case they brought back some dangerous space germs. But in fact, the moon rocks were completely sterile and the quarantine was dropped for later missions. And the president by then was Richard Nixon. Uh, and there he is taking credit for it all. <laughs> and I think we forget now what a tremendous impact this had at the time. And the whole of the landing and the moonwalk were broadcast live around the world and people, wherever they were, stopped to look and listen, aware that they were living through a unique moment in history. And for a brief period, the whole world was united in a way that had never happened before. Global satellite television was only a few years old, so it couldn't have happened before. And it's never really happened in quite the same way since. Well, looking back from today's perspective, how great an achievement was Apollo 11? Well, at the time, some people hailed it as a step in human evolution, but I don't think that's a good analogy. Evolution is a physical change, and landing on the moon didn't change us physically in any way, although it did change our psychological outlook ever so slightly. I think it makes more sense to think of it as a, a step in the technological evolution that started with the German V2 rocket. 
the first of which landed in West London um, just 25 years earlier. There's a memorial there on the spot, not actually very far from where I'm giving this talk. And of course, a lot of the same people were involved because most of the top German rocket scientists went to work for the Americans after the war. So from hitting Chiswick to landing humans on the moon in 25 years is a pretty incredible rate of technological advance. Well, back on Earth, the Apollo samples were received with the same kind of awe and fascination that must have greeted early seafarers during the age of exploration when they arrived home with exotic plants and spices from the other side of the globe. But the difference was that in the space age, these exotic samples were subjected to minute scientific analysis. So what did we learn from the samples brought back by Apollo 11? Well, as expected, the rocks of the Mare surface were like volcanic lava in composition. They'd been molten and flowed out from inside the moon. But as well as these simple volcanic rocks, there was a second type of rock known as a breccia, which is like a clod of rock and soil fused together by the heat of impacts. But the most astounding thing was the extreme age of the rocks, ranging from 3.6 to 3.9 billion years at the Apollo 11 site. Now that's over 80% the age of the moon. So the face of the moon is very old indeed. During that time, the face of the earth has been continually reshaped by continental drift, mountain building and erosion and the laying down of sedimentary rocks. But there's been none of that on the moon. And incidentally, if you've ever wondered what happened to those moon samples, not just from Apollo 11, but all the missions, they're still held in NASA's Space Center at Houston under sterile conditions, and they're available for further study by future generations. And I can't leave Apollo 11 without showing you this. It's the bottom half of the lunar module, still there where it was left all those years ago. And it's been photographed by a NASA spacecraft called Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And as well as the descent stage of Eagle, you can see some of the equipment that Armstrong and Aldrin put out, including the laser reflector and the seismometer. And over on the right, you might just be able to make out the trail that Armstrong left in the soil as he walked over to this nearby crater to take pictures. And this is the panorama that he took. Starting with the inside of the crater and swinging around to the lunar module and finally his own shadow. And just think, when tourists go to the moon, this is the place that they'll all want to see, Tranquility Base, where it all started back in 1969. Well, it's often forgotten that after Apollo 11, there were another six missions, and I won't go through them all in detail, but I'll pick out some highlights. Now, as you already know, Apollo 11 landed over there on the right in the Sea of Tranquility. But the next mission went over to the left in a part known as the Ocean of Storms or Oceanus Procolarum. And Apollo 11 was the one that landed within walking distance of the Surveyor 3 probe that had been sitting on the surface for over two and a half years. And this is one of my favorite pictures from the whole Apollo series. I just love the idea that this old probe has been sitting there abandoned on the moon all that time. And one day, a couple of astronauts just walk up to it. And the bit on it that the astronaut is reaching out for is the camera. And they cut it off and brought it back for examination to see how it had stood up to being on the moon for two and a half years. And you can see this camera on display in the National Air and Space Museum in Washington. It's been to the surface of the moon and come back again. Well, I showed you the picture from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter of the Apollo 11 landing site. And this is the Apollo 12 site seen by the same probe. And here's the bottom half of the Apollo 12 lunar module. And here's Surveyor 3 on the slope of this shallow crater. And you can probably see several darker trails on the surface where the astronauts scuffed up the soil during their moonwalks. There's one leading from the lunar module to a little group of craters on the left. There are actually several tracks going up to various experiments they set out up at the top there. And there's one leading to the right, which then carries on down to Surveyor 3 and beyond. So all the Apollo missions left their mark 
on the lunar surface. And we can now follow the tracks of all the moonwalkers thanks to these incredible pictures from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And you can find them on the internet completely free of charge. Well, the next mission, Apollo 13, was due to land at the formation near the center of the moon, moon called Fra Mauro. But the landing was abandoned because there was an explosion in the service module on the way to the moon. And I don't know if you've ever seen the film with Tom Hanks, Apollo 13, but it's actually very accurate. And it brings home that it was a real matter of life or death. And they were, they were lucky to get back alive. And Apollo flights were suspended for several months while the spacecraft was modified to prevent anything similar happening again. Well, the next flight was targeted to the same spot. And that's because the geologists were particularly interested in this area because it consisted of rocks ejected by the impact that created Mare Imbrium to the north. And by sampling it, they could date when Mare Imbrium was formed. And the rocks turned out to be 3.9 billion years old, which tells us that's also the age of Mare Imbrium. And it's also pretty much the same age as the oldest rocks found by Apollo 11. So there was a pattern emerging of major impacts around 3.9 billion years ago, followed by floods of lava that filled the lowlands and formed the lunar seas. The Apollo 15 site is probably the most spectacular of, of any that the astronauts visited, and it's certainly my favorite. They landed next to a winding valley called Hadley Rill at the foot of the mountains bordering the Mare Imbrium. There are quite a number of valleys like this on the moon, and they're thought to have been carved out by lava flows. So again, this was of considerable geological interest. And this landing was the most alarming of all the Apollos, as two of the footpads, footpads slipped back over the edge of a shallow crater, and the lunar module came to rest at quite a tilt. Now, fortunately, it was still within safety limits. But if the lunar module had started to overbalance on any of the landings, the astronauts would have punched an emergency button and the top half would have pulled them clear. Now, this mission was notable for the first use of a moon car known as the Lunar Roving Vehicle. And it was stored in the lower half of the lunar module, and the astronauts unfolded it after they'd landed. And it was electrically powered, and it had wire wheels, so there wouldn't be any punctures. And it allowed the astronauts to explore a much wider area and carry back lots more rocks. The Apollo 15 astronauts drove to the edge of Hadley Rill. And this is another of my favorite pictures, looking up the rill with deep shadows and the rocks tumbling down the side. And along the sides of the rill, the astronauts were able to see layers from the various lava flows that had built up the mare around three and a half billion years ago. Well, scientists were particularly interested in finding parts of the original lunar crust dating back to just after the moon was born four and a half billion years ago. And they thought they'd find it in the highlands near the center of the moon. So that's where the next mission, Apollo 16, was sent. But they were wrong. Instead of the original lunar crust, as expected, the area turned out to consist of rocks thrown out by the impacts that formed the lowland basins around it. So it wasn't much, a lot different from the area already sampled by Apollo 14. But they did get lucky and found one rock, which was indeed nearly 4.5 billion years old. And I've circled it here. <clears throat> and this is it in the laboratory back on Earth. Now, you might think that this looks like any old lump of rock from a building site, but it is a sample of the moon's original crust. And it presumably ended up at the Apollo 16 site after having been thrown there from an impact somewhere else on the moon. Apollo 17 in 1972 was the final mission, and it landed in the eastern side of the Sea of Serenity between the Taurus Mountains and a crater called Littro. And this mission included the qualified geologist Jack Schmidt, and here he is collecting some samples with a rake. They encountered some very big boulders on their travels, but their most famous discovery was orange-colored soil, which really stood out in contrast to the gray and colorless surface around it. And this orange soil consisted of tiny glass beads, and they're thought to have been 
produced by a volcanic eruption about 3.6 billion years ago. They were then buried by lava and brought back to the surface much more recently by an impact nearby. So what were the Russians up to in all this time, apart from getting wildly jealous? Well, I mentioned earlier that they liked to run spoilers, and they actually sent an unmanned probe to the moon called Luna 15 at the same time as Apollo 11. Now, they didn't say what it was intended to do, but it crashed on the moon while attempting to land on the same day that Armstrong and Aldrin walked on the moon. And it wasn't until over a year later that we eventually found what they've been trying to do, which was to bring back moon samples automatically. And they finally managed it in 1970 <clears throat> with Luna 16, which scooped up a handful of lunar topsoil and brought it back to Earth. Now, there aren't any really good pictures of Luna 16, so I've taken these illustrations from some Russian stamps in my own collection. Now, the Apollo missions each brought back boxfuls of rock, so Luna 16's cupful of soil doesn't seem very impressive by comparison, but it was certainly much cheaper and safer than sending humans, even though you couldn't pick and choose what you wanted, like the Apollo astronauts did. And there were two more of these Russian sample return missions, and they helped extend our knowledge of the moon to sites not visited by Apollo. The Russians also had an, an, another nice idea with a remote-controlled moon rover called Lunachod. And this landed two months after Luna 16, and it was driven around by controllers on Earth for nearly a year, like a remote-controlled car. So these moon rovers and sample return missions by the Russians have helped fill in our picture of the moon, although inevitably they paled by comparison with Apollo. But the Russians were also up to something far more spectacular. We now know that they were secretly working on their own equivalent of Apollo, although they denied it at the time. The idea was that they would send two men to the moon, not three as in Apollo, but two, and one of them would have descended on his own to the surface in the Russian equivalent of the lunar module. And it was designed pretty much along the same lines as the Apollo lunar module, although it was smaller. And you can see the two of them side by side in this artist's impression, the Russian ones on the left. And they even built various prototypes, which still exist. <clears throat> and this is one of them, which was on display in the Science Museum in London a few years ago. And to get there, they built a rocket called the N1, every bit as big and powerful as the Saturn V. And they test launched it four times, fortunately without anyone on board, because it blew up each time. And after the success of Apollo 11, the whole plan was scrapped, which is just as well for the Rus Russian astronauts, because to me, I think the whole scheme looked like a death trap. So what did all this exploration tell us about the moon? Well, one of the things that scientists had hoped to learn from the Apollo missions was how the moon was formed. Was it originally a separate body that was captured by the Earth, in which case the compositions of the two bodies would be quite different? Or were the Earth and the moon formed by side, side by side, in which case they would be very similar in composition? Well, it turns out that although the moon's composition is quite similar to that of the Earth, there are enough differences between the two to show that the moon incorporates material from another body which has now vanished. And the currently accepted theory is usually called the giant impact hypothesis, or, or simply the big whack, because it envisages that the Earth was hit by a stray body about half its size, roughly the size of Mars, while it was still very young, as shown in this computer simulation. Now, it's very much speeded up, of course, but <clears throat> the impacting body is destroyed in the collision, and as you can see, a lot of debris is thrown out around the Earth, and the moon would have formed from this debris. So some of the moon comes from the Earth, and some of it from the impactor. And this collision is thought to have happened about 100 million years after the Earth was formed. So the moon is just a little bit younger 
than the Earth, and that fits with the age of the oldest rocks brought back by Apollo. Now, the material thrown off by such a huge impact would naturally have been very hot. So the moon started out with a molten outer layer, which cooled to form the first crust. And that first crust is what the Apollo mission spent so much effort trying to find samples of. And then around a billion years, four billion years ago, came a series of spectacular impacts from remaining bits of debris. And they excavated the large basins. And these basins gradually filled with lava to form the dark lowlands that we still see today. And since then, <clears throat> nothing very much of importance has happened in the past three billion years, apart from the occasional smaller impact which blasted out prominent craters, such as Copernicus, seen at the bottom here. So that, in a nutshell, is the history of the Moon as we understand it today, but there are inevitably still a lot of details to be filled in. So finally and briefly, what's happening now and in the near future? Well, interest in exploring the Moon is growing again. NASA is currently working on a project called Artemis, in which four astronauts, including a woman, will be launched to the moon in a spacecraft called Orion, which is like a supersized version of the Apollo command module. And here's the two of them side by side for comparison. Apollo on the left with three astronauts and Orion on the right with four. And to launch it, they've built a new rocket called the Space Launch System. Not very imaginative a name, I'm afraid. And this will be NASA's main launch rocket for the future. It's not quite as big as the Saturn V, but it's more powerful. And they can add bigger stages to the upper stages to increase its carrying capacity. And here it is in the middle compared with the Space Shuttle and the Saturn V. Well, the rocket had its maiden flight last November when it sent the Orion capsule around the moon and back again on a mission lasting three weeks. Now, there weren't any humans on board, but there was this little chap, Sean the Sheep, and he was on board because the European Space Agency has built part of the spacecraft, and he was there to increase public interest in the flight in Europe, particularly among children. And here he is strapped into his seat, awaiting launch with his laptop open and looking rather thoughtful. Well, like the old Apollo capsules, Orion splashes down in the ocean and it's recovered by a ship, which is what's happening here. But to actually land on the moon, they're going to need a lunar lander as well, which will be launched separately. And NASA's paying Elon Musk's SpaceX company to build one. And this is the proposed design. And I think it looks like something out of one of those old science fiction films. Now, according to the plan, two astronauts, including a woman, will touch down in this near the south pole of the moon and stay there for a week. But when's that going to happen? Well, the target date for the first landing is supposed to be in two years time, 2025. But I'd be very surprised if they're ready by then. They've got to test the lander, including an automated landing without a crew. And they're developing new spacesuits as well, which will also have to be tested. So I'd say that target date is almost certain to slip and by at least a year. But America isn't the only nation with designs on the moon. China is becoming a big player. They've sent a number of probes to the moon, including the first probe to land on the far side of the moon. And this is the first view we've ever had of the surface on the far side, which, as you can see, actually looks pretty much like the surface on the near side. And here's a little rover that trundled down a ramp onto the surface to explore the surroundings. And since then, another Chinese probe has brought back their own moon samples. And of course, they're interested in the possibility of finding minerals on the moon that could be used for commercial purposes, such as making electronics. And this raises interesting legal questions about mineral rights on the moon, because the existing space laws just don't cover it. We're going to need new international laws for mining the moon. And good luck with who, to whoever has to negotiate those. And the Chinese, of course, also have their own space station in orbit around the Earth. Now, this doesn't get much coverage, but uh, not in the West, but it's actually a very impressive program 
And clearly, the Chinese have ambitious goals. So I'll leave you with this question. Which nation do you think will be next to put humans on the moon? And if you want uh, a summary of um, what I've been talking about, uh, go to my website, ianridpath.com, and scroll down to the button on the right, almost at the bottom there, and uh, you'll find uh, quite a number of web pages about the history of lunar exploration that I've written to accompany this talk. So anyway, that's it from me, Chairman. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you much, Ian. <laughs> I'm sure we've got lots of questions, especially from Prim. Prim's always very excited, and I'm, I'm always putting people on the spot. Um, but uh, Ian, uh, there are lots of conspiracy theories about the moon landings and things, but there were some genuine oddities, such as the rendezvous radar being on accidentally, or any thoughts on some of the <coughs> sort of some of the, the mistakes perhaps that were covered over in Apollo 11. Well, I think it's like anything when you do it for the first time, you're, you're bound to make mistakes. And, you know, the conspiracy theorists can, can make a case out of tissue paper. So, you know, I'm, <laughs> I, I really don't bother with, um, with refuting those kind of things because it's, such blatant nonsense and and they they do seem to have gone a lot quieter more recently particularly since we've got those uh, lunar reconnaissance orbiter pictures of the uh all, all the the lunar modules and all all the other spacecraft actually on the surface of the moon well you should come to some of our outreach events um when we have a couple of hundred people in front of the telescopes i can guarantee we'll find at least one person who denies the moon landings um, oh dear, that's that is sad. I'm sorry but, to hear that. But you are right. There's probably five who are talking about UFOs. Mm. So yes, it's... okay. Well, I'm I'm have more fun talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> what questions have we got? I think they're all asleep, aren't they? Huh? I mean, uh... Thanks, Ian. That was a, a great talk. Um, Thank you. A, a few things I was going to ask, following on from what Simon said, I, I had heard, I don't know if it's true, maybe you can confirm, that they um, missed their actual landing spot that they were supposed to go to, and mm. they just flew it and nearly ran out of fuel. Is that true? Oh, yes. Mm. Yes, that's one of the, um, the famous stories that, I mean, Armstrong was very cool. The automatic landing system was taking them down into a field of rocks which would have been disastrous. So he cut off the automatic landing system. And he took over manual control. And he flew along for a bit further and found a nice spot to sit down, <clears throat> to set down. And, and they were down to, um, well, no one's quite sure, maybe 20 <laughs> seconds of fuel at the end. So, yeah, he was, he still had plenty in hand, and but it was ultimately a very good feat of piloting and required extreme calmness under extreme pressure uh, and I, I i and the more you think about it the more you realize what an immense achievement that was yeah i mean having watched first man you could tell he was literally like the coolest man on the planet um <laughs> Definitely the coolest man on the on the moon, I guess. Yeah, he he wasn't very demonstrative at all. No, um, actually, um, no, I, I, he was actually. I didn't like that film very much because I I thought if you look at pictures of Armstrong, he's usually smiling. He's got a little sort of half smile. Mm -hmm. I think he was a much warmer person than than that film portrayed. The, the film portrayed him as very cold. I thought, but whereas if you see interviews and see pictures of him. I, th I think he was actually much, much warmer, but just just not very excitable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Um, can I ask, do we ever see any um, sort of big impacts happening, you know, as we've got the reconnaissance orbiter and stuff? Do we actually see any, like, major impacts going on on the moon? Um, well, these days, not major impacts, but there, there's certainly been at least one um, photographed recently, it was a few years ago, I forget the exact year, some of you may remember this better than I do, but there was a total eclipse of the moon, and people were photographing the moon, 
and there was a little bright spot suddenly popped up during the eclipse. And it was a small meteorite obviously hit the moon wow. during the eclipse. Now, you know, what's, what are the chances of that happening? Um, it would be very difficult to find this new crater. It would be possible. Um, they have actually found the impact sites of um, other spacecraft, our own spacecraft that have been uh, sent to um, just crashed into the moon to to finish them off. So I suppose you might be able to find where that meteorite hit. But um, yes, there there are occasionally very few, a, a very a few cases like that, but nothing of any real size. And is that just because there was more stuff going around at the early stages of the solar system and it got bombarded at that point? Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah, most of the most of the junk has been swept up now, at least in our area, which is just as well. But of course, you know that there are occasionally there are asteroids and things which come our way. There was, you know, every so often now we're better at spotting these things. And there are lots of quite close flybys, which you hear uh, hear about in the news, which we never that they were always happening, but we never saw them before. And of course, there was recently last year, there was that asteroid redirection test where they sent up a little mm. um, probe to to practice hitting the moon of an asteroid and see what yeah. what happened. So I think you'd you'd send it out of the way. I used to say we'd send Bruce Willis, but he's not he's not very well these <laughs> days. So I I don't think we'd we'd send Bruce now. We'd we'd send a, an automatic probe. Shame. Thank you. Hi, Ian. Um, in your very last slide, you said which country is likely to send their people next people in on the moon um whether it's america and or china um which country do you think will and why at the moment the americans are ahead but they are they're taking it slowly and i think if the chinese did something spectacular <clears throat> like sending men around the moon not actually on the moon but sending around the moon or oh, and women humans around the moon yeah uh i think the american public would wake up to the fact that the chinese are real rivals and they'd probably want to accelerate the lunar program so i still think it will be the americans but you know the don't as i'm sure you don't don't underestimate the chinese <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay thank you Hi, Ian. Thank you very much for the great talk. Um, Thank you. Can you do, do we know anything about the uh, the ongoing American program, about what they have in mind? I, I noticed that uh, they're heading for the South Polar region, presumably to look for water. That is the idea, um, yes. The possible water deposits, which you could use for um, you know drinking or making fuel. That's the idea. <clears throat> so landing in the, the, the South Pole is actually going to be quite interesting in itself. Yeah. Uh, but every time I I look, um, the plans of change, you know, the, it, it's terribly vague. They don't seem to be right. committing themselves to a lot. And whenever you read something, it, it you know, go back three months later, they it seems to have changed. So at the moment, I think the plans are still pretty vague. So we don't know anything about whether they're intending to look towards a moon base or anything like that? Oh, in the long term, of course, you're going to have to set up a moon base. And th this is why I, I think that people who say we should go to Mars are wrong, because you, you've got to practice living on the moon before you ever go to Mars. You know, you use the moon as a stepping stone to Mars. Yeah. So the idea of just heading straight off to Mars, I think, is daft. You've got to spend 25 years setting up moon bases and learning to live on the moon before we should even think about going to Mars. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the, the crew uh, that have been are now announced, we've got uh, two um, American gentlemen, one American woman and one Canadian. Do you think the Canadians got any chance of getting onto the moon? <laughs> Well, none of them have because the crew that's been announced. Oh, that's Artemis too, isn't it? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, the, there was a, an intermediate step which I left out. That the next thing they want to do, probably in a year or so, is to send a crew of four around the moon. You, you might remember the Apollo Eight actually went around the moon 
without Lang, but because they were still developing the lunar module. Um, so this is sort of a repeat, an extended repeat. It's going to be much longer than Apollo 8, <clears throat> but th there is going to be that circumlunar flight without attempting to land because they won't have a lander. And there are, the crew of four has been announced, uh, as, as you say, as one woman, one person of colour, as they put it, um, and one Canadian. I don't, I don't actually know how the Canadian got in on that, but um, they will be going around the moon. But no, the, the first crew that will land on the moon uh, has, has not yet been announced, and I don't think it will be for quite a while yet. Yeah. And what's the chances of the first European? Um, well, I think Tim Peake has retired, hasn't he? So <laughs> I don't know. Um, maybe, well, it depends how much the European Space Agency contribute. They contribute something, but uh, no, I, 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 well, your guess is as good as mine, probably better, actually. It might be Sean the Sheep again. <laughs> Say again? It might be Sean the Sheep. Oh, Sean the Sheep, yes. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, and can I just ask another one? Um, talking of the, the next module, I hear it's going to go out further um, from the Earth than any module ever has mm. done. So therefore, it's going to go further out than the Apollo 11 ones, than the Apollo ones did. Why is that? Is it, are they going to orbit at a, at a further distance from the moon before they land, or is it just... Yes, possible? it's going out into a huge loop. And to be honest, I do not know why that is. Right. <laughs> I think they're going on a free return trajectory as well. So if the engines all fail, they're coming back to Earth. Right. Which was the original plan with Apollo. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions from our Zoom audience? We'll be quiet out there. <laughs> no? OK. Well, thank you very much, Ian, for an uh, enlightening talk. Um, we'll watch it all develop over the um, next uh, couple of years. I think um, Artemis 2, that's end of 2024, isn't it? That's November, December 2024. That's what they've said, but I don't believe it. I, I don't think, <laughs> I think it'll be at least three months later than that. <laughs> yeah, so that'll last in 25, so um, the, yeah. any chance of doing the, la um, the crude landing is going to be yeah. 2026. Yeah. No, I was alive when a, the Apollo astronauts landed. I'm not sure I'm going to be alive when the Orion astronauts land. <laughs> uh, uh, well, it's, it's going to be quite interesting because uh, for Apollo, the risk appetite, they, they took a lot of risks on that program. Um, uh, they tested the spacecraft once and then they went for the next iteration. Um, so if you, you just had a, a good piece of work on that particular one, it could... And that's what we saw some problems with Apollo 13. That risk appetite is definitely being wound back hmm. um, for uh, Artemis. So as you say, they're going slowly. Part of that's being driven by risk. How much do you think is driven by politics? Driven by finance. Driven yeah. by finance as well. And 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 there isn't that impetus the, the, to, to beat the Russians the way there was with Apollo. That's why they took risks. You know, Apollo 8, the one that went round the moon, uh, wasn't even originally in the planned succession of missions. They put it in for two reasons. A, because they thought the Russians were going to do something similar. And secondly, because the lunar module was running behind and they couldn't test it. So they just sent three men around the moon at Christmas uh, back in 68, wasn't it? Um, so as I say, if, if the Chinese suddenly started doing something spectacular, then I think the the Americans might get a get a move on. Yeah, pull their finger out. Okay, well, and there's lots of other um, nations out there with budding space programs. There's lots of commercial support that's going to go on with the Artemis missions as well. So, mm. as you said, Elon's got to build the lander, and he's still concentrating on getting Starship off the ground. Uh, I'd like to thank you. Ian. It was great. Thank you very much for. My thanks, and I hope I will be able to see you in person one day. Thank you. Thank you for asking me. <laughs>